Um, for those of you who haven't been here before, we are the Marine Environmental Education Center located out on Hollywood Beach, Florida, and we are still closed, but we wanted to make sure we could still interact with the community, supply some really cool resources, um, even with us being closed right now. So we decided to create an online webinar series and we reached out to some of our really awesome friends in the marine science community to make sure that we would have some really cool stuff to talk to you all about. So today we are lucky enough to be talking with Curtis Slagle. He is the uh, permit holder for the Broward County Sea Turtle Conservation Program. Um, he is the project manager. So they are the ones that are kind of really closely related to us. Um, they are our sister company almost. They are the ones out on the beaches, uh, walking up and down, monitoring the nests and making sure no one's bothering sea turtle moms, no one's bothering sea turtle hatchlings, keeping track of those and really putting in the hands-on conservation effort that is so important. Um, so today he is going to talk to us a little bit about what they do um, and a little bit about what he does. Um, I think I did accidentally mute you, Curtis. Um, so feel free to unmute yourself and share your screen. If you guys have any questions, please keep yourself muted so you can most clearly hear Curtis. Um, but we will keep that chat option open. So put any questions into that chat. Curtis will see them. He will either answer them throughout or at the end. Um, so feel free to write them down so you don't forget them. Um, and if anyone has any technical issues, just put it in that chat as well. Christina and I are here to sort of help from afar if we can. So whenever you're ready, Curtis, feel free to take it away. Sounds great. Uh, let's go ahead and do the share. Uh, thank you everybody for uh, making time today to come hear me talk about sea turtles uh, and also a big thank you to uh, the Marine Environmental Education Center um, for giving me the opportunity to I guess my, my PowerPoint closed down here sorry about that Give me one moment here, but uh, thank you for the opportunity. And once it loads up, hopefully we can get rolling. Okay. All right, great. Hopefully everybody sees everything at this point. That's the, that's, that's the goal. So uh, as uh, Taylor said, my name is Curtis Slegel. I'm the project manager and marine turtle permit holder for the Broward County Sea Turtle Conservation Program. I've been, I've, I've held this position since 2014. So I've had quite some, quite some time out there on the beach, uh, marking nests and uh, contributing to sea turtle conservation. Um, so for today, we are going to uh, be discussing sea turtles just overall, give you a good idea of uh, what they're all about, send, uh, send along some facts and things. We're going to be discussing what our program does and you know, what are we actually doing out there on the beach and then give you a solid 2020 nesting update. And then of course, uh, what you guys can do to help out sea turtles uh, and other wildlife in your area. So to kick things off here, let's go through some fun turtle facts. Uh, the big one here is that they are very, very old. They've been around a long, long time. Uh, they actually predate the dinosaurs. Uh, so they've been out there in the ocean enjoying life for many, many years. Uh, we check out this uh, interesting photo. This is the mighty Archelon, uh, which is one of our, you know, extinct now, but uh, one of our, our bigger sea turtle uh, species from, from another time period at, at uh, full size, they could get up to 5,000 pounds, be you know, 15 feet uh, long. So they were a pretty impressive uh, sea turtle species. I probably would be a little bit terrified if they existed today, uh, just knowing that turtles like to eat anything that swims in front of their face. So it would be kind of nerve wracking to be in the waters with, uh, with this guy, but uh, he's not around anymore. Sea turtles are reptiles. So what are some facts about reptiles that we should all know? Well, they're vertebrates, okay? They have a backbone, they breathe air. So unlike fish, sea turtles do have to emerge from the water to get a good uh, breath of uh, fresh air. They are cold blooded, so they are not able to regulate their body temperature. Um, they have to rely on the environment to kind of 
keep them at the appropriate temperature. Um, although there is an exception to that rule, and I'll get into, into that later. They lay eggs. Uh, sea turtles uh, specifically are going to be all um, uh, animals that are going to lay eggs on sandy beaches. And then, of course, they have scales of you know varying degrees and sizes, um, but those are sort of all of our reptile qualities. Uh, now, a big question we get a lot is how do you tell the difference between a, a male and a female sea turtle? And the answer is um, there really isn't an easy way to tell. Uh, it's practically impossible until uh, they are adults. And when they are adults, uh, females, the, the picture on the left here will have a short tail, uh, while males, pictured on the right, are going to have a, a long tail. But up until that point, there's no way to just uh, be able to tell by looking at the uh, turtle itself. And then sea turtles are only going to emerge onto beaches to lay eggs. Uh, they don't come up to the, the sand for, for any reason beyond that. They are almost entirely going to spend their, their time in the ocean. Um, so here's a brief overview of sort, sort of the life cycle here. Um, we have sea turtles spending a vast majority of their life at sea, uh, some you know, 20, 30 years before they're able to reproduce. They're going to uh, head on down to, to breeding grounds. And then uh, after mating, females will emerge onto our beaches to lay eggs. Those eggs have to incubate, and then they will hatch out and head out to the ocean, kind of get uh, swept away in the Gulf Stream and restart the whole cycle. Uh, now, I mentioned that they're only going to emerge if they're going to lay eggs, but there are a few exceptions. Um, sometimes sea turtles will actually come onto the onto the shore to just sit out and bask out, uh, just like um, just like you imagine most freshwater turtles would do. Um, so here is a, a green sea turtle in Hawaii, uh, hanging out next to a monk seal. Just uh, two guys hanging out, getting getting a nice tan. Um, so if you're ever visiting Hawaii, you know, try to make sure to check out this site. It is not, it's not a very common sight to see. So it's pretty interesting when it does happen. All right, so the big question here now is, if we have a good idea of what sea turtles are. Uh, how many species do we, do we think there are worldwide? Now, normally uh, I would go around the, the audience, the room and try to get a good idea of what you guys think there are. But um, instead, I'm just gonna give it to you straight. There are seven species, okay? One sea turtle for each day of the week. Uh, we have our, uh, our good old loggerhead right here. Um, most common nester you'll see in uh, Florida. Then we have our green sea turtle. Uh, this is the, t the turtle that's featured in such films as Finding Nemo. Um, so it's kind of like the, the poster child for all things sea turtle. Then we have the leatherback. Uh, which in my opinion is the coolest of all the uh, currently living sea turtles. Um, now some would say that that is an opinion, but I would actually lean on that being fact, but moving along. And we have the Hawksbill sea turtle, as well as the Kemp's Ridley, the Olive Ridley, and then finally the Australian Flatback. Uh, so these are all the sea turtles that you would see if you happen to tour the entire world. Um, but uh, this is going to be a presentation focused on what's happening here in Florida. So unfortunately, uh, we're gonna have to part ways with a couple species. Um, as you can imagine, the Australian flatback uh, does not make uh, too many visits to South Florida. Um, so we'll, we'll leave them over there uh, down under. And then the other species that rarely makes an appearance in Florida would be our good old Olive Ridley. Uh, they're more so focused in, you know, around Africa, the West Coast of um, like Central America and things like that. So these remaining five species are the ones that you're going to see around Florida. The loggerhead, the green, and the leatherback are going to be species that will regularly nest on our beaches. So if you're out on the beach at night, you know, you might, might come across one of these uh, ladies out there doing their work. The Kemp's Ridley and the Hawksbill don't really regularly, I guess, nest in Florida. Uh, there are some nests, of course. Uh, you can get Kemp's Ridley's nesting on the West Coast, you know, around the Panhandle and things. Um, and you can get some hawksbills nesting in uh, the, the Florida Keys or maybe um, some parts of Palm Beach County and things. But 
the the in, in terms of quantity, these numbers are you know beaten out pretty significantly by the the green, the loggerhead, and the and the leatherback. Uh, usually, hawksbills there might be a handful of nests a year, and maybe Kemp's would be a dozen or two. Um, so we don't really consider them regular nesters, especially not um, over here in Broward County. So let's go through uh, these guys. Uh, we first one up. We'll we'll talk about the leatherback. Uh, the leatherback is the largest sea turtle uh, currently living. They, when they're adults, they can get to be 800 to 2,000 pounds, and they nest uh, from March until June. Um, so they're going to be some of our our first turtles that make an appearance out here on the beaches. They are a rare nester. Uh, less than one percent of all of our nests in Broward County are uh, coming from this species, and then that's not to say that they're that they're doing poorly. Um, it just, we're, we're just not their preferred location. They, they, they prefer to be in other parts of the Caribbean, but um, they also pretty much go wherever they want um, uh, worldwide. And we'll, we'll get to that in, in a moment here. Uh, leatherbacks, they like to eat squishy things. They like jellyfish, they like tuna kits and things like that. Uh, pretty much anything that's soft and gelatinous they're going to uh, eat up. Um, so part of the reason why they're my favorite is that I imagine if they had the same diet as me, they probably would, would, would enjoy gummy worms and fruit snacks. I lost, uh, I lost my light. Okay. Well, give me one moment here. I guess this is a thing. <laughs> We're just having all sorts of fun today, folks. Uh, so continuing on, just focus on the slide. Don't worry about my camera. Uh, if we check out the, the skull of the leatherback, we can see that uh, they have kind of a, a specially designed uh, skull for, for feeding, and, and you'll find that all sea turtles will have that. Um, the, their, their beak, uh, the uh, structure you see on the front of their face, also known as a ramatheca, is going to be um, kind of curved so that they can kind of uh, easily uh, grab their, their food. Um, and then if you look inside a leatherback's mouth, they have all of these. Uh, Papillae. Uh, so the idea here is that once once food comes in, it, it can't come out, even if um, you know they're they're struggling a bit. Now this is going to be present in all sea turtles. It's not just a, a leatherback exclusive. Um, but the reason that they really want to have this is because they don't want to ingest a whole lot of salt water. Uh, believe it or not, just because they they, they live in a marine environment. Uh, does not mean that they want to uh, sort of deal with that um, uh, deal with that excess salt. So what they'll do is they'll they'll ingest their food and then they'll actually squeeze out all the excess salt water and the food is going to stay nice and snug in uh, in place right inside their mouth where where they want it. All right, uh, so moving along, we have the green sea turtle. Uh, the green sea turtle is the largest hard shell uh, sea turtle. Uh, it gets to be about three to 500 pounds. Uh, so definitely some, some big girls and, and, and lads out there. They like to nest from June to September. Um, so they come pretty late for Broward County. And they're our second most common nester. About five to 20% 20 20 of all of our nests are going to be contributed to this species, uh, depending on the year. Uh, greens like to eat green things. Uh, they do have a, a transition in their diet. They do, they do start off eating uh, on a sort of a carnivorous basis, um, eating you know, fish and things like that. But um, later in life, they switch to an almost exclusive vegetarian diet. They like to eat seagrass. And um, the interesting thing about the green is that they actually get their name uh, not from the color of their shell, but uh, by the color of the fat inside their body. So because they eat so much chlorophyll, or sorry, uh, greens, they get a lot of chlorophyll, a pigment, and that pretty much sticks around after they ingest it. So back in the day when, when people did uh, you know, not so cool things like make turtle soup, uh, and they would harvest uh, that from the green sea turtle, they noticed that, well, that fat was kind of like a nice bright green color. So that's where the name derives from, fun fact. And if we see the, uh, the green uh, skull, we notice that it, they have what appear to be teeth. 
uh, but it's not, it's not actually teeth. Uh, they're just little serrations made of keratin, the same stuff that your fingernails are made of. And um, they just use that to slice and dice through all the, the seagrass. Then we have our loggerhead. Uh, loggerhead is a medium-sized turtle, hard shell, uh, about two to 400 pounds. Uh, they nest from, from April all the way until August. Uh, so they kind of land right in the middle of our nesting season. But they're our, our more, most common nester. Um, by far, uh, loggerhead nesting is, is you know, the most significant in, on Broward County beaches, 80 to 95%, depending on the year. Uh, loggerheads uh, like to eat things that are crunchy, you know, uh, conch shells, uh, crabs, things like that. And they have a very uh, enormously large head. And that's actually where they get their name from is the fact that their head is so large that you know, sailors used to thought that it was a log floating in the water, uh, but really it was just a sea turtle. You can see the size of their skull has plenty of uh, locations for muscle attachment to be able to crush through anything uh, sort of in its path that it wants to eat. Um, so pretty, uh, pretty impressive. Uh, now the loggerhead is a very important um, species for this area because Florida is actually one of the biggest nesting sites in the world for this species. Um, if it's not number one for any particular year, it's gonna be a close second. Uh, so roughly about 40% um, of the global loggerhead population actually ends up nesting uh, in, in Florida. So we are a very special place for this species. So although we see a lot of them and it might not be as exciting, um, because we don't get as many of the other species, just remember that Florida is playing a very key role in the overall success of this species. Then we have the good old hawksbill. A uh, hawksbill um, is going to be a bit smaller than the loggerhead, about 200 to 375 pounds. Uh, we've only had three confirmed nests in Broward County uh, throughout our program's history. Uh, the reason for that is because the uh, the characteristics that we use to be able to determine if we have a, a hawksbill or a loggerhead, the, the characteristics are pretty similar. So it's hard to tell the difference between the two species. Um, the other thing is that, uh, like I said before, they don't really like to nest in, in Florida. Um, they prefer more the Caribbean area and other parts of the world. Um, so we're not gonna see a whole lot of them here, but you will definitely see them diving, especially down in the Keys. Now, the unfortunate thing about the hawksbill relative to other species is that its shell is very beautiful, which has led to a lot of um, poaching over the years, unfortunately. Um, so this, this species has been targeted more in the, the jewelry trade than, than any others. Now, hawksbills get their name because their, their beak Kind of looks like a bird uh, in the in the shape of a hawk's beak there. So they use that specialized beak to be able to uh, reach down and grab their food source. And what they actually like to eat are corals. Uh, corals are sort of their their main food source um, out there. Not corals. I'm sorry. Sponges. I'm looking at corals and I'm getting all confused. Uh, sponges actually are what they're what they're going for. Um, so they use that beak to get in those sort of tight to reach uh, hard to reach areas. And we just get a closer look and see how, how narrow that, that beak actually is. Then we have the Kemp's Ridley, a pretty, pretty small species, only about 100 pounds uh, when they're fully grown. No nest in Broward. Uh, they really do not swing by this neck of the woods, um, e even in, in weird seasons. Uh, they have a pretty distinct shell. Uh, it's, it's, the only, it's, it's, it's a species that has um, a shell that's, that's wider uh, than it is long. So that's, that's pretty interesting. And the Kemp's Ridleys, they, they like to eat crabs pretty much. Crabs are their, are their big go-to. Um, and they like some other things that are crunchy, but um, they'll actually use their specialized, uh, their beak to kind of pierce through the, the crab shells and to be able to get to all the, the yummy good stuff on the inside. All right, so those are the, uh, the five species we see a whole lot of um, around here in South Florida and, and um, Broward County. Um, so 
these species um, are all threatened or endangered um, at this point in time. Now, some are doing better than others and some areas are doing better than others, uh, but that's the current status right now. Uh, so they are protected on a federal and state level because of this. Um, and there's conservation efforts on all fronts to help uh, sort of uh, reduce the uh, impacts that these, um, that basically what, what humans have done over the years. So a uh, big one here, nesting surveying, heading out to the beach, marking and protecting nests. Uh, that's, that's a big, uh, big change over the last 30 to 40 years. Rehab centers where injured and sick turtles go to feel better, hopefully, and get released at a later point. As well as stranding response, uh, heading out to the, to the water and trying to uh, you know, transport and, and help out sea turtles um, that might be injured or ill. Turtle excluder devices in the fisheries industry. And then just good old general education helping people know more about these animals so that they can do their part to help the species uh, continue to thrive. So why are uh, sea turtles in their current predicament? Um, well, predation, predation happens. Uh, you've probably seen a whole lot of videos on National Geographic and things regarding that. Um, so. You know, on land, we have you know, foxes, raccoons, and crabs. You know, even pets and shorebirds can kind of uh, do, do their part. Uh, now, the thing, though, is that most sea, turtle, sea turtles are going to make their move during the nighttime. So um, this predation won't be as, as bad as some of those uh, videos, you know, make it out to be. But definitely make an impact. And, and sometimes, as, as you can tell with this picture with the raccoon, Sometimes they get to the, the turtles before they're even given a chance to hatch out of the eggshell. Now it's once they get out to the ocean, a lot, a lot of shorebirds and fish, and e even the adults can be uh, targeted by some larger animals like sharks. Um, so pretty much it's a rough life for a sea turtle. Um, when, when they're small, they're basically appetizer size for just about anything. And when they're big, fortunately, there aren't too many things that could get to them, but you know, there are still plenty of sharks out there that, that make it work. So this is a, a pretty, you know, for the most part, natural uh, sort of threat to sea turtles. The remaining threats are all due to humans, unfortunately. Um, so going through some of these categories, uh, habitat loss, you know, coastal armoring, which is uh, set up to protect uh, coastal properties, which of course is, is important. You want to be able to uh, preserve, you know, those beachfront properties, uh, but it does limit the amount of beach there is due to uh, increased erosion. Uh, same thing goes for rock revetments. And then uh, the creation of jetties, which again, we need for uh, transporting goods and uh, travel and things like that. Uh, but these sort of activities prevent the natural flow of sand and really do impact the amount of habitat that these animals have to nest because when they, when they decide to lay eggs, their only option is to come ashore to lay eggs. They don't lay eggs at sea. Um, so if we don't have a whole lot of sandy beaches, then they don't, don't have a location to, to continue the uh, sea turtle life cycle. Here's a nice uh, image. Uh, this is Port Everglades in Fort Lauderdale in 1928. You can see that, well, they, they did make the jetty, um, but for the most part, it seems pretty untouched. And then if you look at it now, uh, you can see there's been quite a bit of development over, over a relatively short amount of time. Um, so as more and more uh, people come to Florida, as population grows, there will be uh, more more uh, struggles with this particular uh, issue. Beach erosion is a problem as well. Um, part of that is due to the things I just mentioned, the armoring and things. We, we wanna have a solid dune system in place so that that will help trap the sand. And it's difficult if there are buildings there in place of dunes. Uh, so you can see in this photo, we have actually uh, two exposed 
egg uh, clutches, essentially. Um, the sand has been washed away too much and now eggs are exposed. And as you can imagine, that's not a great environment for them to be incubating in and we'll have to actually move those uh, eggs in that situation. And all of this is uh, a contributing factor from uh, coastal development. Another big issue is light pollution. Um, art, artificial lighting that, that kind of spills onto the beach uh, can actually play a pretty significant impact to sea turtles. Uh, sea turtles will in part use light to navigate them towards uh, the ocean uh, after they're laying eggs or after they emerge from the nest, they will uh, emerge and find the brightest horizon kind of opposite of a dark silhouette and they use that as a guide. And they have some other clues as well about you know, beach slope and things like that, but it can be very distracting for the, the animals, uh, for both hatchlings and adults. Now, as you can imagine, if the lights are too bright, a sea turtle might not even emerge to lay eggs or maybe she'll lay eggs, but then she'll get confused on how to get back to the water and she'll waste energy and when you're out there fighting for your life every day, you don't want to waste any en energy uh, whatsoever. When, when we have hatchling disorientation, they emerge from the nest and they have a very limited supply to go do what they need to do. And every foot extra that they have to crawl is less energy needed to swim out to the Gulf Stream, get picked up by the current and start their whole journey. Um, so we've had, you know, plenty of reports of these guys walking hundreds and hundreds of feet uh, the wrong way because of coastal lighting. So um, all of these things really impact sea turtles, especially in very developed areas like Broward County or Miami-Dade County. Uh, fortunately for us, we do have uh, three volunteer groups that do uh, night, nightly patrols to make sure that sea turtles are uh, rescued if they're disoriented. Uh, those groups being uh, Sea Turtle Oversight Protection, also known as STOP, the South Florida Audubon Society, and then uh, STARS, which is Sea Turtle Awareness, Rescue, and Stranding. Um, so definitely helps um, out the, the, the local turtles, making sure that um, they're protected both day and night. So here's an example of a nest where everything is just going swell. You can see that uh, like right by the, the stake, that stake with that yellow sign, the sea turtles have emerged uh, close to that point. And we have all of those little tracks heading right to the water. Th there doesn't seem to be any confusion whatsoever about where the turtles need to go. This is good. This makes us in the turtle business happy. Then we have this nest where the, sea, the turtles emerge from, the, from like the, the middle of that nest and they're just going everywhere. There seems to be no general focus point. And to give you an idea, the ocean is uh, towards the top of the screen. Um, so we have plenty of turtles that are not doing the right thing. Um, not their fault, right? They're, they're confused from the lights, but generally speaking, this is bad. This is bad, we, we do not want to see this. Some other issues that are a problem, beach furniture, Turtles do get stuck in this quite a bit, uh, more than I'd like to like to uh, admit. Uh, so here we have actually a green sea turtle stuck under a stack of beach chairs, and we've had multiple turtles this year that have been stuck under uh, stairwells and actually a jet ski. So uh, having a, a, f a free beach of all these different obstructions is a uh, is what what you're shooting for. Then of course there's poaching. Uh, sea turtles are hunted uh, to extract their oil, to get their leather, the shells. Uh, some people eat them, eat the turtle or eat the eggs. And uh, sometimes they're used for, you know, jewelry and decorative pieces. And I mentioned before that the, the hawksbill is kind of the, the target species here. Um, so unfortunately, uh, these sort of things still happen. Um, they still happen in the U.S. and in other parts of the world. There's obviously uh, a lot of laws in place to help reduce those things, but it's still an ongoing struggle. Uh, now this is uh, not necessarily poaching. Uh, this is a photo representing over harvesting. Uh, so back when sea turtle consumption was legal, 
in the uh, 70s and, and er earlier years. Uh, pretty much too many turtles were harvested for, for all those things I listed previously, and it pretty much crippled the population. So although a lot of those other factors are definitely an issue for them, the, the real big issue that brought them to the, that point was this over harvesting in the uh, early years. Some more problems sea turtles face, pollution. Uh, they get trapped in a whole lot of stuff, nets, fishing line. Uh, turtles like to eat just about anything they can. They're, uh, they're similar to a small child. If it, if it looks like food, they're gonna eat it, whether it's a plastic bag or a straw. Um, so keeping our, our beaches and oceans clean is, uh, is a must. In addition to that, when you have uh, situations where maybe not plastic and garbage is being added to the ocean, but other things like chemicals and, and uh, fertilizer runoff and things, that can sort of uh, leach into uh, ocean systems and can lead to uh, compromised immune systems for sea turtles and other things. And it can lead to the expression of the fibropapillomavirus uh, that sea turtles have. Uh, think of it like chicken pox for them. Uh, they'll actually grow fleshy tumors or around areas with a lot of blood flow, uh, like around uh, their, their flippers, around their, their eyes. Um, sometimes it's not a terrible deal that they, they can continue to, to, th to, to live on just fine. And other times, like the picture on the left, it severely impacts their mobility, their ability to feed, their ability to um, see. So it can be pretty detrimental for the, the species. And although we don't know exactly what causes fibropapilloma, there are some studies to suggest that pretty much contaminants in the water uh, contribute to it. Uh, whether that, that is um, they assist in the transmission of the disease, or they suppress the immune system so that the, uh, the virus can kind of surface more. Uh, hard to tell, but it is an issue. Boat traffic, as I mentioned before, sea turtles have to come to the surface to breathe. And if, when, if while they're doing that, they get hit by a boat, uh, the boat hull will either, you know, it's gonna crush the, the carapace, the, the, the shell, or it's gonna come by and leave propeller uh, slices in, into the shell. Uh, neither scenario is good. And it leads to a lot of um, a lot of issues, even if the turtle survives. Then there's uh, turtles being caught in uh, fisheries. Uh, so we have a couple examples here. Um, we have a long line fishery and then a trawl net. Um, in both situations, the the fisherman is trying to collect their target species, but, and then uh, either they get uh, sea turtles get scooped up in the net or the, the bait that they're using also attracts sea turtles and they accidentally bite on the hook. Um, both situations are pretty bad for the, the turtle because the turtle has to surface again to, to breathe. And if they get caught in this equipment, uh, they're gonna be unable to surface, kind of leading to sort of incidental uh, death essentially. Now there are some things being done to help prevent this. Uh, big one is changing hooks to to represent more of a that circular hook pattern. Um, this makes it less likely for the turtle to actually bite onto the fishing hook and become entrapped. Uh, the other thing is trying to switch different types of baits, maybe go with a bait that is less desirable for a sea turtle. Uh, both of those have been pretty effective. And then also was the uh, a, a pr pretty good uh, moment in sea turtle conservation history was the invention of the sea turtle excluder device. And essentially what this is, is it's a sort of a, an, an escape hatch for sea turtles. Uh, so what happens is that the, the fish or the shrimp or whatever the case may be, will go through the net and they'll hit a, a metal grate that they can easily slide right on through. Uh, but when the turtle hits that metal uh, grate, they're actually gonna not be able to go through and they're going to slide right through the bottom. Um, so the fisherman is still able to collect their food, and the turtles are able to move on about their day. Some issues with it though, is that there aren't a whole lot of regulations in place for it, and larger turtles still can't escape. The, the, the escape hatch is only so, so big. All right, 
So those are some of the problems facing turtles. That's a basic overview of uh, the sea turtles across the globe. Uh, so now what about us? What's happening here in Broward County and why am I talking to you all today? Well, let's discuss this. Uh, we are the Broward County Sea Turtle Conservation Program and we conduct nesting surveys uh, for Broward County. So here's a photo of us uh, out on the beach with our UTVs uh, looking for sea turtle nests. So we do these nesting surveys every single day from March 1st to October 31st. Um, our program is funded by Broward County. We, we receive a grant from them, um, but the work itself is carried out by Nova Southeastern University. Now to work with sea turtles in the state of Florida, you, you have to actually obtain a permit from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. So we are permitted, we have a couple of them to allow us to uh, do the work that we need to do. We have to go through uh, some pretty rigorous training to be able to do this work. Um, so keep that in mind if you're out on the beach and you happen to see a sea turtle, uh, just remember to um, kind of leave some of those things to the folks that are properly trained to deal with these threatened and endangered species. While we're out there, we are collecting a whole lot of scientific data that we uh, distribute to the county, to the state, and to federal agencies. Um, so they can continue uh, to adjust their conservation management strategies uh, to sort of follow the, the trends that we're observing. So what is it like in the day of a, as we term it, a turtler, uh, somebody who works with uh, sea turtles? Well, first thing is that we get up super early. Uh, we have to be at the beach an hour before the posted sunrise time for that day um, to begin our prep, to get our ATVs ready, to get just everything set uh, to go for the day. Um, we will start 30 minutes before sunrise. Um, so at the, the earliest time of the season, we are actually starting um, around uh, 5.30, I believe, yeah. No, oh, sorry, we were arriving at 5.30, heading to the beach by 6 a.m. So you have to be ready for those early morning days if you want, ever wanted to get into this field. It is a regular uh, occurrence. Now we're out there and we're going to now um, survey along the high tide line. Uh, the high tide line is where the, the ocean meets the sand essentially. So you notice where all the sand has been washed over versus where there's still footprints and things from the previous day. Um, so we will drive along there. The reason for that is one, it's, it's the best location to be able to spot a crawl. Cer sea turtles have to come up from the ocean, they can't fly. They can't tunnel underground, they can't jump. So they have to literally crawl out of the water. And if we drive along that high tide line, there is a very little chance that we're gonna miss any sort of evidence that a sea turtle has been there. In addition to that, a sea turtle is unlikely to nest at the high tide. It definitely happens, but if we drive at the high tide line, we're less likely to hit a sea turtle nest that was uh, laid the night before. So it's pretty much the best place to be. So we're gonna drive along this high tide line until we see something, something like this. This is a set of sea turtle tracks. Um, we can see that they kind of look, look like big tire marks in the sand, and that's what we're looking for. And when, when we find these in the sand, we're going to sort of follow around the entire crawl, and we're going to basically make a determination if we think she laid eggs or not. Um, sea turtles will actually emerge from the sand and decide to not lay any eggs at all and go back to the water. They're a pretty picky uh, species, uh, but it's totally normal. Uh, usually on the most undisturbed beaches, you'll, you'll see a, a, a false crawl uh, uh, rate of 50%. Happens about half the time. They're just picky ladies. Uh, they, they like things a certain way, whether it's the, uh, the way the sand feels, the amount of lighting, if there's predators, if people are bothering her, whatever the case may be, um, they'll, they'll come up and they'll kind of feel out, uh, feel out the area. That being said, sometimes though, they come up and lay, lay some eggs. Um, so here we have a, 
an actual sea turtle nest. Um, she comes up, see a whole lot of digging going on, uh, and then she returns to the water. Uh, so we'll go over that in, in a moment here about all the specifics. Here's another example of a crawl that we, we would see. We, we would notice that this nest looks a bit different from the other ones. And um, the reason for that is that this is a different species. Uh, this is a green sea turtle. And we can see that um, some species are a little bit more dramatic when they're digging their nests. Uh, greens are notorious for digging these large spray areas and these big, almost like uh, bomb-like pits in the sand. Um, so we're trained to be able to distinguish which species uh, is, is out there purely based on the characteristics that we see in the sand, how she crawls, how she digs, the size of the crawl. Um, all these go into our sort of uh, factoring for trying to determine whether or not she nested and whether or not it's a loggerhead green or leatherback. Now that's not the only thing that we're going to um, uh, do out there. Once we determine that we do have a nest, we don't just uh, collect data and move on. We want to protect that area for the duration of its incubation. We wanna make sure that those eggs are able to incubate safely. So we will actually uh, mark off the entire area. And although this isn't some sort of secure, you know, high security type of perimeter, um, people are generally respect, respectful of the area and they'll leave it alone. Um, you'll know where you shouldn't put your umbrella in and maybe where you shouldn't rake out sand. So these simple perimeters uh, are actually quite effective at keeping the eggs safe. We do other things while we're out there we might um, monitor our restraining cages. So the, these are cages that we put in strategic areas um, so that when the turtles eventually emerge from the nest, they um, will not be distracted by the coastal lighting in the area as much um, and they'll actually be restrained so that they're unable to be disoriented um, if they, if they uh, wanted to. Um, and then we have people come by throughout the night, um, as well as those volunteer groups. We'll monitor these cages, and if there are hatchlings present, we will bring them down to the water's edge and safely release them and make sure that all turtles make it to the water um, safely. We'll also keep an eye out for strandings. Since we're out there so early, sometimes we are the, uh, the first person on site. Um, so we just want to make sure that everything is uh, a-okay. Then we might re relocate nests. Sometimes nests are in areas where they are unsafe, so we have to move them to a safer uh, location. Um, so we will carefully remove the eggs because the eggs are very delicate, and we will move them to a spot that is uh, safe. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're like, wow, this is super, super interesting stuff. This is exciting, um, but um, you know, how do you really go about determining uh, whether it's a nest or a false crawl or, or what, what species it might be? Well, don't worry, I have an answer for you uh, coming up right now. Um, as a heads up, uh, those nests are gonna be there for out there for a couple months. And after those two months, the nests will uh, begin to hatch. Uh, so I got a little quick video here for you. Uh, although this normally happens at night, uh, sometimes we are very uh, fortunate to be able to spot it during the day. And you can see we have a, a nest of loggerhead sea turtles. They're busting out um, as, as one big giant group. That, that's how they uh, prefer to emerge from the nest, We're working together. Um, it also makes them a little bit safer when they're out in the water. You know, safety in numbers, um, and although you know your brothers and sisters might get eaten up, you know maybe you'll sneak on by. Uh, so this was a pretty pretty exciting day for us. But yeah, so those nests hatch two three days or uh, two months later, and then um, after they they hatch, we will actually dig up those nests, and sometimes we get live turtles uh, stuck inside. So. Let's talk about the nesting process. We have a better idea of how uh, we know, I guess, what's going on. Uh, so 
the turtle's going to come up onto the beach. She's going to find a spot that she thinks is just swell. It's great. Uh, so she'll do, uh, she'll, she'll dig a body pit and then she'll actually dig a, um, a small egg chamber where she's going to deposit her eggs. Once she lays all of her eggs, she'll actually uh, camouflage them by using her front flippers to cover up the entire area. So here we go. We have a, a crawl. We can see those tracks in the sand. Um, here are what the different nests look like for each, uh, each species. So for our loggerhead nest, uh, loggerhead nests have alternating flipper marks. The tracks are about 40 to 60 centimeters wide. And then the, the mounds are not very, very large relative to the other species. So here she comes up, she's heading out that way. This is our, our body pit where she's camouflaging the nest. And then this is the actual area where the eggs would be hidden. This is where she sprayed sand all over to camouflage their location. And this process continues for the other species. Here's our green nest from earlier. Uh, we sort of see the same um, sort of features. Tracks coming in, tracks going out. We have a large pit where she basically threw sand all over the place to camouflage the eggs. And then we have that nesting site uh, that, where the eggs location has been uh, safely camouflaged underneath the sand. Leatherbacks are a little bit different um, in the sense that uh, they're experts at camouflaging. Uh, so not only will they come up and you know go out like all turtles do, and they'll they'll have an area of digging where they uh, camouflage everything around it. The thing about leatherbacks though is that they like to crawl over their mound after they're done. So not only do they camouflage it by spraying sand over it, they will actually crawl all over it so that it is extremely difficult to know where those eggs are located, even though they followed the exact same process as the other species prior to that point. We can see all those uh, loops that she makes. Um, so very uh, impressive camouflagers for sure. So let's play a little game, nest or false crawl here. All right, we have a picture. Uh, what do we think it's gonna be? Well, we have a big spray area a big body pit where she's camouflaged, definitely gonna be a nest. Um, this looks like a, a green sea turtle. Uh, their big characteristic is that bomb-like pit. What do we have here? It looks like we have a, some alternating flipper marks, um, whereas the greens and leatherbacks are simultaneous at the same time. It looks like we have a good old loggerhead, uh, but it's gonna be a false crawl. We don't really see any digging going on. They definitely have to dig um, if you're going to have a possible nest. And here it seems she pretty much just came up and left without doing anything special. This one's a little bit harder to tell, uh, but we still see some of those characteristics. We see a fluffy mound area towards the left and a body pit towards the right. So she must have laid some eggs. Then we have this, kind of seems like we have a nest, right? There's a, there's a pit, I see a little bit of spray area, uh, but this is actually gonna be a false crawl. Um, and the reason for that, and this kind of comes with training and experience, but the level of sand spray and camouflaging that happens is also a factor in determining if you have a nest or false crawl. What, what happened here was the turtle started to dig, was kind of feeling that location, but then for whatever reason decided to abandon it and continue to move on. So she never actually made an egg chamber. Uh, this is what, what we, we would call a body pit. All right, uh, so this one, very similar. We see that spray area, we see a pit, uh, but you'll notice this uh, little shallow hole here. And what this is, is a, it's an abandoned egg chamber. So she did the first body pit, she dug into the sand, she was liking it. But when she did, she dug up the, the her egg chamber, for whatever reason, she changed her mind and just left it as is. So she never laid eggs, she never camouflaged their location. She just dug it up and continued on her way. So false crawl, no eggs are there. Then finally, we have, a, we have a crawl here that goes into the vegetation. When this happens, it's really hard to tell what's going on because the vegetation makes everything uh, difficult to see. Uh, but we can, we can see some, some pretty significant digging going on. So we would rule this as a nest uh, just, just to be safe. You know, we, It's possible that um, there isn't enough going on, but there's enough evidence here to say we got ourselves a nest. So after a nest uh, sits there and incubates for two months and it hatches out, 
we then are going to conduct our nest inventories. We're going to remove everything from the nest, count it up, um, and, and see how well it did. The reason we do this is because uh, it provides us a good hatching rate. Uh, we, we can figure out how successful was the nest. So maybe we have 5,000 nests in Broward County, uh, but if, they, if none of them hatch well, then it's still a poor year. So knowing that is, is good. Um, notice that the, that the rates are a little bit higher for nests that you do not have to touch, nests that are in situ, let left in place, versus nests that we move that uh, drop a little bit in percentage there. Uh, nests can also be very deep. So you notice the picture on the right. Um, sometimes you gotta get help from your coworkers to really get down and grab all those eggs. And then of course, we always get to recover any live hatchlings that we missed, uh, that, that missed the group exit. All right, uh, so the good news about these excavations is that we get hatchlings from time to time. Um, so we have loggerhead, hawksbill, green, and leatherback, although we don't get the hawksbill in Broward. Uh, but unfortunately, only one out of a thousand hatchlings that make it to the water are going to survive to adulthood. Um, but before you get upset, the good news is that every nest might release 100, 150 hatchlings, and uh, a sea turtle can lay multiple nests in any given year. So although the, the odds are against them, um, sea turtles have adapted to the strategy of essentially uh, mass reproduction um, to sort of flood out the market in hopes that um, a couple of them are going to make it through. Here are some quick excavation facts. Uh, hatching season goes from June to October uh, and, the, and those nests incubate for about two months before they hatch out. Um, they're always going to, well, for the most part, they're going to be hatching at night and that is to avoid predation but sometimes they do hatch during the day. Egg chambers can be two to five feet deep, depending on the species. And every nest is gonna have 80 to 120 eggs, depending on the species. Eggs are round and leathery, so they're not hard like a chicken egg. And that's because when they drop two to five feet, we want them to survive that fall. And then an interesting fun fact is that temperature determines the sex of hatchlings. So an easy way to remember it is hot chicks cool dudes. Uh, so depending on what temperature the nest is at, at a certain point in their incubation will determine whether or not you have uh, lady turtles or dude turtles. So that's what our program does when we're out there on the beach. So you might be wondering how we're doing this year. What is the 2020 nesting data looking like? Uh, so let's look at some past nesting data. This is our historical data for loggerhead sea turtle nesting. We can kind of see it bounces around a bit, but the overall trend is good. Uh, numbers are increasing. Um, although it might fluctuate year to year, the overall trend for loggerheads is on the rise. Uh, greens are seeing a more sort of a extreme uh, incline here, uh, especially towards those uh, recent years. We can see that the numbers have been almost uh, increasing exponentially. Uh, but you'll also notice that green sea turtles are a little bit more um, extreme. They have highs and they have lows, and that's totally normal. That's what we actually expect from green sea turtles. They have high years and they have low years. Um, so last year, 2019, was a high year, so that would give you an in indicator of what 2020 might be. Uh, leatherbacks, again, um, are on the rise according to uh, the data. Uh, the numbers are pretty extreme, but definitely take a look at the uh, the y-axis, the scale. You know, we only go from zero to 50 nests. So although these fluctuations seem very extreme, the, the overall number is pretty low. Um, so uh, don't be too discouraged by those kind of those uh, highs and lows. Uh, overall, the, the trend is on the rise. And then this is total nesting throughout Broward County over the years. Um, we were increasing uh, up until about the 2000s. Then there was a little bit of a scare in the early 2000s. Uh, the, the numbers continued to decline, but now we're on the rise again. Um, and we are exceeding uh, all of our previous numbers. 2019 was actually our, our re record year. Um, so that is very exciting news. So looking at some five-year data, um, how are we uh, 
looking to be. So 2016, we had almost 3,000 loggerheads, only 80 greens, uh, not too many leatherbacks, uh, bring us a total of 3,000 and uh, plus nests in the county. 2017, uh, not a big difference in, in the overall total, uh, but the green counts uh, increased significantly and the loggerhead counts dropped. So that was a high green year and uh, loggerheads dipped down a little bit. Uh, 2018, the loggerheads continued to, to decline. Uh, the greens went back to a low nesting year. And again, leatherbacks are really low numbers, um, but um, still, you know, a solid year. 2019, our record year. Uh, loggerheads didn't change too much from 2018, but you can see that our green count, uh, 588, uh, our, our record amount of greens, really, uh, really brought up our, our total significantly. Uh, then finally, leatherbacks also are our highest in quite some time. So how is 2020 shaping up? Well, I want you to really pay attention to, um, to these numbers. These are sort of our, our record numbers for each species from like recent years, you know, five, five to 10 year span. Well, loggerhead and green is, is all time, but leatherback um, re recent time frame. So 2020, we have 2,489 loggerhead nests at this point in time. And by the way, all the other numbers are for July 29th of their respective years. Um, greens is 171. So definitely we took a, took a hit there in the green count and leatherbacks are uh, 28. So overall 2,688 nests in Broward County as of uh, yesterday. So we're not, uh, we're not on track to beat any records, but it's still a, a very good year, um, even though we might not uh, you know, break any, any, any charts. I know you're worried, but settle down, okay? We're gonna be just fine because a couple things to remember is that nesting mothers do not lay nests, do not lay eggs every year. They do take time away to recover, to eat up, fat, fatten up a little bit before they wanna do it again. So although you might see fluctuations from year to year, it doesn't mean that the population's going down. It maybe just means that there's a smaller group of turtles ready to lay eggs for that given year. We also expected a, a, a low green year, totally normal. It's part of their behavior. And keep in mind that nesting is still increasing for all species, um, even with these uh, expected lower numbers. So we gotta think long-term. Don't, don't ever look at it as a, in, in, on an individual basis. Some 2020 uh, fun facts um, are gonna be that we have 2,745 false crawls. Uh, with most of those being loggerheads, um, and then greens, and then of course leatherbacks. Leatherbacks don't really false crawl as much. Um, well, it's also difficult to tell a leatherback false crawl. Um, so we normally see those to be pretty, pretty low. This gives us a 49.5% nesting success, which is amazing. Uh, even on the most darkest undisturbed beaches, you get about a 50% nesting success rate. So the fact that us in Broward County, a very developed beach, is having that level of nesting success is a, a very uh, good sign. The first nest that we had this year was late on February 24th. And if you recall, season starts March 1st. So that was, that was a before season even started nest. Uh, that was a first for, for me and I believe this program. Um, and the good news is that we just didn't have one nest. We had multiple nests and, and a false crawl that uh, were laid before the season started. So we were very curious to see what the season was going to bring. And then the highest daily nest count for this year was on June 17th, where that day we had 62 new nests deposited overnight. Um, so a pretty high number of turtles coming out to the beach to lay eggs on that given day. 44 nests so far have been re relocated. Um, and this is because they're mostly laid in poor locations, um, areas that are designated unsafe uh, before a turtle even emerges. We have 65 of those cages that we're going to put out so far. And then the first leatherback nest for this year hatched on May 12th, first loggerhead hatched on June 13th, and the first green hatched on July 12th. So right now, we pretty much have all species out there hatching. It's a very good time to do our excavations. 
And then uh, hatch nests so far have had a pretty good hatching success. Numbers have been pretty high. And uh, that's probably due to some of the, the higher rain that we had at the beginning of the, the, the season. If it gets too dry out there, the turtles have a hard time actually emerging from the egg chamber. And then they actually will uh, also fry a little bit too much inside there. And so far, no storms really. Uh, so we've had very few nests get washed away by the tides. However, I'm probably speaking too soon because it seems we're gonna have a visitor come this weekend. Um, so we'll see how that turns out. Hopefully the damage is not too much. So what can you do to help our local sea turtles? Well, be sure to properly dispose of all your trash. If you bring trash out to the beach or anywhere else you go out and have fun, make sure that you pick all your trash up and put it in the appropriate trash receptacle. Try to reduce single use plastics. I know straws get the big sort of a uh, big push here, but it's not just straws, it's plastic lids, it's uh, forks and spoons and knives. Anything that you're just gonna use once and throw away, try to avoid using those. Do not intentionally release balloons. Balloons eventually have to come back down and when they come back down in the ocean, they look like a jellyfish, which is a leatherback's favorite food. Plus other species will eat them too. Um, so you don't want to do that. Um, you know, try, try to find other ways to be uh, festive or to honor uh, people. Um, really releasing balloons is not the, the best way to go. Do not disturb nesting mothers um, or hatchlings. If you see turtles out there on the beach doing what they've done for many, many years, just give them their space and peacefully watch from a distance. Uh, but you don't never need to help hatchlings. You don't, you rarely need to help the, the nesting moms. So uh, best just to avoid them completely. Um, but if you do happen to come across one, give them their space. Try to minimize coastal lighting. So if you live along the beach or know people that do, try to educate them about the importance of having um, minimal lighting out there and, and how they impact sea turtles. Stay alert when you're boating so you don't strike turtles when you're out there. And fill in your holes on the beach. You'll be surprised um, how, how often we find adults, but also uh, little hatchlings stuck inside tiny holes left in the beach. So always fill them in so you don't create a, a, an entrapment issue uh, for these animals. Well, that's going to do it for me. I guess uh, video is gonna play, there we go. Um, that's gonna do it for me. Uh, thank you guys for listening to me and again sorry for the technical issues and i'm also sorry that i'm telling you basically a ghost story in the dark here i don't know what's happened to the lights but um at this point i think we'll pass it back on to the folks at the meek and i'll gladly answer any questions you might have beautiful thank you so much curtis i'm sorry that you seem to have a, a lighting issue but you still look great we could see you um and the presentation was awesome there we go. <laughs> Just in time. Um, we do have a couple questions in the chat. So if you want to open that up, um, if you can't see them, I'm happy to read them off to you. Uh, let me. I... Yeah, if you guys have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat right now. Curtis will check them out. Um, and we will try and make sure everything gets answered. All right. Um... Okay. In all of your years working on the beach, have you seen any other species other than the loggerhead, the green, and the leatherback? Um, well, on the beach itself, no, um, I have not. I have seen the other species through some of my volunteer work slash uh, random visiting of local rehab centers. But as far as seeing like a Kemp's Ridley or a Hawksbill on our beaches, haven't, haven't seen them. Um, it's possible that they could have nested, uh, but those track characteristics that we use to determine which species for the loggerhead, the green, or the, lo the loggerhead, the Kemp's Ridley and the Hawksbill, those nesting characteristics are almost identical. So you have to pretty much be there as it's happening to be able to tell which species you have. And we haven't seen it yet. Um, we're always on the lookout, but um, other than other sources, I have not seen uh, other species beyond those three on our beaches. 
All right. Let's see what else. Rockland, what is that? I'm not sure of the question. I'll come back to that one. Um, all right, in your opinion, are the beach beautification methods, uh, raking sargassum seaweed or burying it, harming or hindering the nesting season and or uh, population numbers? Um, so a couple things on that. Um, it, it really just depends on if the work is being done uh, following all the guidelines issued by the Department of Environmental Protection and the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Um, Broward County is a very, um, very developed um, and well-maintained beach. Uh, there's pretty much cleaning going on across the board. Uh, but uh, as long as the regulations are being followed, there shouldn't be any uh, real adverse harm to, to sea turtles. Uh, as far as like nesting goes, folks raking the beach are not going to impact those animals. The, the only real concern is going to be uh, the, the hatchlings because um, depending on when the raking is happening and when there is a hatch out, there's always a little bit of a risk, but there's nothing to any sort of extreme extent that I would be concerned with. Uh, the folks in Broward are pretty, pretty solid when it comes to uh, how they conduct their mechanical beach cleaning. Um, so thus far, it should be, should be just fine. Uh, I don't have any great comment on, you know, the impacts of burying sargasm. Um, that's a little bit out of my, my realm, but from what I've noticed, um, impacts to sea turtles have been very minimal, um, if any. All right, uh, how do you handle a, or how do you manage a situation if a turtle nests outside of nesting season? Um, well, for our early nesters, we basically started season about a week early. Um, we we kind of gathered our forces and started surveying daily. We worked with all of the people that have to use the beach with us to coordinate to make sure that we could do our job effectively. Um, and there was no real, real big difference there. We just started early. If they happen to nest at the end of season, so like let's say we uh, notice a nest pops up on Thanksgiving. Um, we would treat it similarly, um, but we wouldn't be super um, extensive in our daily survey. So usually every year we have nests that continue to incubate after season ends. We actually have had nests that have been still on the beach in December, uh, at Christmas, at New Year's. Um, and what we do for those nests is that we will basically spot check them every week or every two weeks, um, but we will not conduct daily nesting surveys. We pretty much treat those out, out of season nesters as anomalies and not a real reason to thoroughly have to uh, survey every single day. How often do you use cages? Uh, there's a stretch in Fort Lauderdale and Hollywood that we utilize them for. And thus far we use them every season. Um, and they're mostly used between the months of, of June and September uh, when they're most mostly used. How many we use ranges from about 50 to 75 a year because um, we have a, a sample scheme that we utilize so we don't cage everything. Um, it, it would be too much to manage, but uh, we do try to get as much as we can following the conditions outlined in our permit. All right, uh, out of the, the three species that nest on Florida beaches, is there one species we're most concerned about being slash becoming endangered? Okay, um, well, if we wanna talk about Florida beaches, that's probably gonna go to the Kemp's Ridley. It's the most critically endangered of all the sea turtle species. Um, all, all, all sea turtles have areas where they're doing better um, than others. Uh, remember that sea turtles, for the most part, are a pretty worldwide uh, species. So you can get hawk spills, for example, in the Caribbean, um, in the Indian Ocean. Uh, leatherbacks pretty much go anywhere. Their, their body is designed to handle cold water. They actually thermoregulate a little bit. They actually control their temperature. Um, so they go pretty much anywhere, um, you know, even as far north as Alaska. 
Um, but uh, on a on a grand scale, the the Kemp's Ridley is definitely uh, doing doing the worst. Although there are some sort of a recent changes that that do look promising. Um, but they're our biggest target, I would suppose, for the state of Florida, but also sea turtle conservation. But really, all sea turtles are kind of in the same boat. So we want to care about all of them, of course. All right. Um, do, do you think uh, there are more types of turtles that people haven't seen yet? Uh, very unlikely. Um, you know, maybe there, there are turtles from, you know, yesteryear that are extinct and we haven't found the fossil yet. That, that could entirely exist. Um, but since sea turtles have to surface to, to breathe, um, it's pretty unlikely that we would discover a new species at this point. Um, but, you know, the big mystery out there. Uh, but, but from my knowledge, I don't think it's very likely at all to find a new species of, of sea turtle. All right. Why only one in a thousand sea turtles survive? Okay. Um, so if you have a nest and let's say, you know, a hundred turtles come out of that nest, um, they first have to get to the water. Um, and that can be a challenge. Uh, it's difficult to make it through the, you know, predation they might experience, but also just the terrain. You know, the, the beach to us looks simple to navigate, but if you are a tiny turtle, you know, on the range of inches and weighs in the range of ounces, um, it's difficult to even go through, you know, footprints and things. So trying to navigate through that, trying to get past, you know, sargasm that might have built up at the high tide line, then you have to go tackle on the waves, the waves that are, you know, only a foot to us, but are like tsunamis to them. They have to go through that and manage through it. Then they have to swim miles out to the Gulf Stream and you hope they don't get eaten along the way. Then they have to follow the sargasm up the Gulf Stream, uh, up to the, the North Atlantic Gyre, and uh, hopefully eat and thrive for 20 some years before they're able to reproduce. So that, that one in a thousand isn't, um, isn't a number that means as soon as they hit the water, it's from, from the time reaching the water to being able to reproduce yourself, a one in a thousand chance. So we're looking at the long term something in the range of 25 years. Um, so it's just, there, there, there's a lot to go through uh, during that time. Um, so it, it's, it's a tough life for a sea turtle. How do you manage the situation? Oh, okay, that one. Um, and then uh, when will the night rescue teams be out on the beach again? Broward County beaches have been closed due to county emergency order. Super, okay. Um, that I do not know. Uh, that decision ultimately uh, lies upon uh, the state uh, and Broward County. Um, we're pretty much just out there following what we need to do. Our program is um, exempt due to the uh, contracts we have in place by Broward County. As far as when the beaches will open again and thus allow the volunteer groups to return, I don't have a good answer for you. That's that's out of my call and. I know as much about that as everybody else, unfortunately. Okay, that uh, concludes all the comments that I've read. Are there any more questions you might have? I've lost my light again. <laughs> um, yeah, guys, if you have any more questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Otherwise, if you think of them later on, you could email us at meek, M-E-E-C, at nova.edu. And if we can't answer them, we will send them straight along to Curtis because he knows all of the turtley things. Um, if you missed the beginning of this presentation, it is recorded. We will be posting it to our YouTube channel. Um, and next week we are starting our August webinar series. So sorry that we haven't had the full schedule out there yet. We still had a few things to finalize, but next Tuesday at 1 p.m. we'll be talking to Lauren Gomez and she will be teaching us all about the Florida manatee, which should be really cool. We haven't gotten to talk about those guys yet. Um, so if you have any questions, just reach out to us on any of our socials or emails. Um, otherwise, thank you very much for coming today. And thank you so, so much, Curtis. Today was very cool. Oh, Sydney, I love that turtle. <laughs> very nice drawing. Um, thank you very much, guys. Have a great day. Stay safe out there. Thank you.